Okay. Can you hear me now? Am I loud? It seems like you should be able to hear me now. Hopefully it's okay. No? Wait, you said no to... I asked if you could hear me and you say no? Are you messing with me? It's gotta be someone else who can respond. Okay. Hmm. Hold on. I had to open up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I was I was going to open up uh open up on Twitch to see. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Well, welcome everyone. We have a bunch of returning viewers, returning community members, and we've got some new people too. It's great to see everyone. So, Today, I'm sure most of you have some idea. Some of you might not know what we're going to do today. Some of you probably have more of an idea than others. We are going to be showing how to deploy your web applications from uh, sort of like a development server to a full-on production server. So why don't I show you what I'm talking about? And if you want to, yeah, you're ready to repl it? Let's go. Make sure, if you want to participate and follow along, would highly encourage you. I am going to use Python. However, what we're going to be discussing is not, is not technically exclusive to the Python language. It's going to use a certain protocol, which I know there are libraries that support it in Ruby and Perl, and there might be other libraries that support it in other languages that I'm not aware of, but we'll go into more on that later. So why would you want to deploy to a um, development server? Or sorry, deploy to a production server? Well, why don't we just start making a normal Flask app and then you'll start to see why. So we're gonna import Flask, classic Flask. Then we're gonna just make an app. So flask.flask. Then we're gonna just provide the project name we're, we've always been diversifying our social media content. We've got a TikTok, we got everything. We're gonna create a root. So we're gonna use the app, create a root. Also, I got some big text, so hopefully it's pretty easy to, to see what I'm writing out. And let's see, we're gonna call this index. That's gonna be the function that listens onto the root. And then we're just gonna return hello world. All right, and then we're gonna do a classic if name equals main, which if you don't know, this code means that if someone were to import this file, it would not run the following code, which, you know, that's not always necessary. And this is probably not necessary at all, but you know, it's probably a, a good idea. Oh, can you hear the key switches? Is it that loud? <laughs> is it bad or good? Like, I like to hear the mechanical keyboard. I don't know what you guys think. Do you guys like to hear the mechanical keyboard? Let's see. Then we just do like an app.run. We can put it in our host. We can just do, for the port, we can just do 8080, run it, and if I did it right, hopefully I didn't forget anything, we should have a pretty just basic, basic Flask app. It's going to install it. Obviously, Replit has to, whenever you create a new REPL or start a REPL after a while, it has to locate a new machine. So, yeah. Oh, also, you guys are going to get a preview of some of the new things we're working on with uh, the inspect element built into the REPL. If you're an explorer, you'd already have seen this. So, and if you're not an explorer, this is probably your first time to, to check it out. I actually don't know if it's going out to all explorers or just some of them. Regardless, some pretty cool stuff is going on. Uh, the VOD is going to stay on the Twitch and then hopefully we may edit this one and then make it like a YouTube short or something. Maybe put a short on uh, the the uh, TikTok. Hello, Naor. I'm glad you all could join us. So if we look at the console here, it'll say we're serving the Flask app. The environment actually says production, which is interesting. And but it gives us the warning. This is a development server, and I believe if we actually set debug equals true. Oh. I've been using, I've been programming in Java too much, so that true needs to be uh, uppercase. 
Okay, looks like debug didn't change the environment to development, but it did enable the, uh, the debugger, which is typically what you'd have on if you were in a development server. So, there is this key warning here. Warning, this is a development server. Do not use it in a production development. And then it has the added text, use a production WSGI server instead. So what does that mean? What is a production development, whatever? And what is an S, what is SWSGI? That is, and this is not specific to Python. If you are going to, in most servers, if you created it in Ruby or you created a server in Perl, you may also get this same answer. So what is WSGI? Well, the easiest way to think about WSGI is imagine you have you have your server right this is your server let's see right here right this is right here this is your server normally if a client were to connect to you they would just go this is the client they would make a line that's the connection from the client to your server boom one straight line perfect for development purposes for example or for uh, very simple like maybe you're you have a website and you only like get like five requests a day That's going to work perfectly fine However, when you start to get a lot more load when you start uh, to have a lot more people use your website all at once and You start serving a lot of people things are going to get complicated and all of those were boom You're gonna have multiple clients in one server all of them are connecting to the server that server is going to get overloaded very quickly. So there's a lot of different ways to solve this problem and WSGI is one of them. So the way the clients communicate to the server, all these different clients, they all communicate through HTTP. And that is, you know, the internet standard makes sense. It's how all these websites communicate. However, it's not the fastest protocol ever right like it's all kind of text-based it's all human readable and so that makes it pretty easy to debug and build around but can create issues when uh when it comes to speed so there is a solution to this problem right the solution is to use wsgi so i actually don't know what wsgi stands for Let's see, WSGI definition. Web server gateway interface. That makes a lot of sense because it's exactly what I'm going to describe. The clients, right? You have all these clients. Let's say all the clients connect to this one WSGI server that is between your actual HTTP server. Now the WSGI server can handle all of these connections because all it's going to do for every single connection is to throw it to a different worker. So when you start the WSGI server, it's going to take your HTTP server, like the Flask app I just made, and it's going to make a bunch of different processes, each with a Flask app, each with this Flask app. And so when it receives a connection, it's going to forward that connection to uh, a random process, well, not random, based on however much load other processes have. It's gonna send that information to the child process, but it's not going to send it in HTTP because it's not a proxy. This is not a round robin server. It's going to send it in a much more efficient format, a WSGI protocol format, which is somewhat similar to HTTP, but has a lot of key differences, which is gonna make it a little bit faster. So. Does that kind of make sense as to what WSGI is? Maybe we can look at some of the images here. Let's see. Oh, I think I have I have my pro, my like picture like flipped on this one. So whenever I switch between them, I like switch sides in size. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Is there a good diagram to describe this? Let's see. Boom, you got your people, your web browser, communicating to HTTP. All those communicate to a web server. 
And then your web server, actually, a neat thing that we're going to see, your WSGI can also handle st static files by itself. So Flask will never have to touch static files, which is much more efficient. And then, of course, it communicates through WSGI with your Python application. Now, in this diagram, there's just one Python application. However, most of the time, and in this case, it's actually going to create a bunch of different processes, which can all run and take advantage of the different cores, something Python and other languages normally cannot do very well, and serve a bunch of different clients much more efficiently. Okay. So, with that out of the way, let's take a look at how to build one. So, the first thing we're going to need is the actual server, right? So, let's take a look at Flask production. Uh, am I in the full web? Yes, I am. Production servers. So, the Flask documentation actually has a bunch of different examples that you can use. There's all these hosted options. Don't worry, Replit is going to be your host. And then there's these self-hosted options, which is what we want. So popular ones are Gunicorn, uh, UWSGI, Gevent is one. There's Twisted Web, a little bit sketchy. Um, and of course, there's also um, uh, Fast CGI is a popular one. And ASGI is another somewhat popular one. So these are all different self-hosted options. Now, you may see, like if I go to, for example, the one we're actually going to be using today, UWSGI, it should, a lot of the things that they talk about, this is the UWSGI docs, they're going to be talking about things like uh, Nginx, right? Oh, welcome, Coding Cactus. They're going to be talking about things like Nginx. And Nginx and Apache are both uh, popular web, ser web servers that you can run on Linux machines. Now, when you see that in different documentation and whatnot, you can basically just ignore that when you're using Replit. Replit will do all of that for you, which is super great because normally configuring those things are such a pain. So you can totally ignore that. Replit will handle the Nginx for you. All you need to worry about is the self-hosted WSGI servers. So in this tutorial, we are going to be using, let's go into Replit mode, right? I'm going to flip around. Boom, flipped around. We're going to be using uh, UWSGI to handle the WSGI format. So we can go to packages. And we can just type a lot of different ways to install packages. But there's UWSGI. Found it. And then we're just going to, boom, install. This will hopefully take a second. Now, I actually have already tested this. But I tested it in a Nix REPL. But now, all the REPLs, Python REPLs included, already have Nix included, which is pretty awesome. And also, you don't actually need Nix. So, well, okay. That's not actually true. You can use Nix to install an optional dependency, but we're not going to be using that optional dependency in this tutorial. I should also slow down and stop talking so fast, right? I need to take my time. We have an hour and 30 minutes. I kind of knew going into this that it might be a little bit difficult to fill up all that time. So, like, while this is a song, like, how are you guys doing? <laughs> Well, I know I'm doing, I like, the, the pacing is fine, but I actually should slow down. I, I don't want to use up the full, like, we could be done in, like, 30 minutes, to be honest. You're going to do it on Rails? Yeah, does Rails have WSGI? I'm pretty sure it does. But I didn't actually, like, confirm that? I think so? Don't know. Maybe if we have extra time, you can help me do Rails. We'll take a look at Rails. I have a pro membership, but I'm not super familiar with Replit. Where is a good place to get started? Well, I mean, that depends on what you want to do. Um, you can build basically anything on Replit. If you want to build a website, well, this is the place to be <laughs> for that tutorial. Replit is simply um, just a place to write and run your code. 
it is just a personal computer online. Um, so whatever you want to do on that computer, you can totally do. Okay. So we've got UWSGI installed. So let's take a look at how we get started. So for this example, let's say we're going to create a website and we want just to kind of simulate um, load. We're going to just add a, um, a one second kind of pause in the program. So let's do, however, we can't just do a normal pause. Just like if you were using um, a, a SyncCO, a Sync IO, uh, and wanted to, to sleep, do like a time.sleep type thing, you have to use the asynchronous version of time.sleep. So same thing, we have to use the UWSGI version of time.sleep. So let's import UWSGI. And then, uh oh, well, that's not great. We have some module issues. UWSGI. That's not very nice. Let's take a look at this. We got to do some debugging already. I was not anticipating this, <laughs> but that's okay. We have tons of time. Let's see. We'll go into, I want to go into the files. Let's look at our lock. Click, flask, UWSGI. Let me compare that to my other server. UWSGI. That should be right. Hmm. That's very odd. <laughs> wow. Okay. Can we do a poetry? The poetry is a package manager that Repla has installed. Poetry show. Poetry run. Oh, I did just said show run. I did not spell poetry at all. Poetry run, or no, I mean the shell. Already activated. Hmm. Oh, it's already on. Oh, well then, that's weird. Let's do, just this, this is a sanity, sanity check here. No module UWSGI. Hmm. Very odd. Okay, let's hold off on that. You can't see the leftmost sidebar? Oh, that's technically intentional. You got a package operation failed from the plus. What package are you trying to install? Let's try this. Uh, That is quite odd. Let's uh, kill the ripple and try again. You know what? We'll even avoid importing UWSGI for now. Yes, there is a Nix package, but in the Nix project, I didn't install UWSGI through that. not installed. See, I'm installing UWSGI fine. Hello, first time viewer. Real Miha, hello. Okay, well, we got Flask working again. So let's just, let's start by, you don't actually use UWSGI through importing. Technically, you don't even need to import it. You could actually just, you use it by running it in the command line. So to do this, we're going to need a .repl file. So what is our .repl file going to have? We're going to have a run command. So by setting run in a .repl file, we can change what happens when we press the run button at the top there. So first thing we're going to do, we're going to do 
Hmm. Maybe I should have done this in a Nyx. A Nyx replica. Poetry run. I shall just do poetry install if it's not installed. Po then we're going to do poetry run. UWSGI dash I. Actually, we'll avoid that for now. And then we're just going to set the socket. So we need to set where we're binding our server to. <clears throat> That's going to be 0.0.0.0 0 .0 port 8080. Or it doesn't matter what port. Actually, Replit will automatically figure it out and start redirecting traffic. 8080 works. 5000 works. Doesn't really matter. We're going to set the protocol to. I think HTTP is the default protocol anyways. But, you know, it's good to be a declarative. Protocol is HTTP equals HTTP. And then we're going to mount it. So to mount it, we actually need to create a WSGI file. And this is just the WSGI file is good just because um, as your as your project kind of grows, your app may like change location. And then all you need to do is just do from main see this is why we did the we did the if name equals main so that way when we import it it won't mess around with it from main import app and then we want to do if name equals main i suppose actually we could set main to the app but this is just good practice and how the documentation suggests you uh handle this so we're going to set the wsgi to that then we're going to mount it. So to do that, we just need to mount it to the index equals WSGI and then app. So the WSGI folder and take the kind of app variable out of it. OK, let's try that. Let's see. It is going. To, oh, and there it goes. So just immediately, boom. No independent, no, so this is from poetry. No dependencies to install or update. And then we have starting UWSGI. And as we can see, it is run, it's gonna give us some information about the machine, uh, some other information. And we can just simply open in a new tab. Let me switch to full so you can see this. Boom, hello world. We've got it all. So hopefully, I'm not sure why you're getting an error with the installation. Maybe you can put the error into chat. We might be able to help you. I was able to install U, uh, WS, UWSGI just fine. How would you guys say that? Would you say UWSGI or would you go like Uzgi? Or like, how would, like, that's, I feel like it would be a lot of fun to just kind of take different like package names and then ask random people who have no knowledge of programming at all. How would you say this? Uzgi, I think UWSGI is like the correct way, but like Uzgi is pretty good. I like that too. All right, we have Uzgi or UWSGI installed and running. However, we're not really taking advantage of it right now. All we're really doing is just saying, yeah, here's our server. But what's happening right now is all these different clients are sending all their requests to Uzgi. And then Uzgi is just sending all of those requests to one Flask application. We're not actually taking advantage of the server at all. Now, despite that, it might actually be better <laughs> it might actually be better than just using the default flask uh web server but we're, we can make it we can make it even more production ready than that let's take it let's take a look at this error poetry add uzgi environment command error errored with uh oh then it cuts off That's very odd.
Too many lines of face. What was what was the end of the line? What was the end? What did the end say? And you installed it just through the packages because it worked just fine to me. Unknown descript distribution option descriptions. Let's see. Hmm. So there's an error with the setup file, but there wasn't an error with the setup file for me. You installed it through the, the packages on the left side, UWSGI. It is, it should be the first package. Very weird. Well, you can also try going to the shell and typing poetry add UWSGI and see what happens there. That's a, that is another option that might possibly work for you. However, we still got this web server to work on. So. We're going to set a um, error linking. Cannot find end curses. Oh, interesting. Why is it with something with Nix? Hmm. Okay. Well, well, we'll hold off on that. I will I will get back to you on that. If anyone else is following along, let me know if you have any similar issues and we might stop more and uh, look uh, try to address that. But hopefully this should be if you're using a Python REPL and whatnot, it should be fairly reproducible. So we are going to create my project that INI. So if you're not familiar, an INI file is uh, just a configuration file. So it's a way to just store um, different settings like yes, no settings, and amount settings, all in a file. To begin the config, we're just gonna do brackets, UWSGI, simple enough, or oh, that's just WSGI, Oozgi. Windows uses those, Windows uses what? Windows uses, oh, INI files? Yes. Yes, I think Windows does. I mean, I think Linux uses those too. I, think, I don't think they're specific to any particular operating system. Oh, my invisible hand. I have no hand. That looks so weird. Okay. I had to, I had to get some more water. It's very, it's very dry where I am right now. Makes it hard to talk. Okay, so what are we going to put in our config in our configuration file? Well, the first thing that we should probably do is we want to set strict equals to tr oh that's just strict strict. Oh my goodness, I cannot type. Strict equals to true. When we do this, it's basically saying okay, if there is an error. If there is an error with how we configure um, our config, w what we put in our config is wrong. Maybe some setting is like has a typo in it. Don't run the program. Let us know what the error is. And this is great for especially when we're um, like starting and trying to get this working. So it'll let us know if there's any mistakes that we make. The next is going to be master equals true master equals true is basically saying we need to have one process that is going to be the master process. If I were to use a program like Nginx that knows how to communicate better with my WSGI server, I might not have a master server. Nginx would be my kind of master server. However, Replit needs a single program to send all this information to. And I think even like Apache needs a single program to send all the information to. So that's why you would have a single master process enabled. All right. And then we're going to go enable threads equals true. And this is so now some of you may know that Python 
Python's threads are iffy. They don't necessarily run at the same time as you would expect because of the GIL. However, because this, pro this program, WSGI, is creating processes with threads in them, we can actually take advantage of threads. And we can also do that with something that we're going to talk about soon. Now, in addition, we're going to set another uh, yeah. another setting, vacuum, to true. What vacuum is going to do is basically if, uh, if I shut down the master process, take down all the threads. Don't leave any threads running. I don't know if that's enabled by default or not, but it's good to set that to true in the config because we definitely don't want threads just yes. running around when the program is off. Then we want to have a die on term. And this is saying if our program receives uh, a sig term, which is basically a signal that says turn off for Linux, take down everything, shut it down. If we set that to false, if we told it to shut down, it wouldn't, which might be desirable if you're like, for example, this massive company like Google. You don't necessarily want, if like a developer accidentally presses control C, you don't want them taking down all of Google. So that might be a, a reason to set that to false. However, for our purposes, we want it to be, uh, to be true. Then we're going to do need app equals true. This is much like strict when strict was just checking the config need app is basically saying if you can't find the app that we want to use to run the HTTP server, don't run the program. Don't try and run it. That can be confusing if that's false because you might think it's running and then you go to the website and it's actually not running because it couldn't actually find the app. So that's a very helpful thing to turn on. Then we're going to go async equals four. That sets the amount of asynchronous um, programs we want running. I think at once out of our sync pool. You can actually uh, increase this to something like, um, to like, I think, um, I forget if this number is based on the number of cores or not. I'm going to keep it at four because that's the number of cores your Replit process is going to have. I forget if that changes if you boost it or if the CPUs just get better. That might increase if you boost it. Regardless, you can experiment with trying to increase it to see if that uh, helps you at all. Let's see. Do we have any messages? Oh, someone went to dinner. Very nice, very nice. I haven't had lunch yet. That's what I'm going to do after this is have lunch. So if you have any lunch suggestions, definitely let me know because uh, I'll be hungry. <laughs> then we're going to set Ugreen equal to true. So Ugreen is basically a coroutine system. This is the system that is going to use the asynchronous cores. Then we're going to set listen equal to 1024. This is a somewhat arbitrary number based on um, uh, Linux's max amount of sockets it can have open for a single process. So basically, we're basically saying, okay, once we hit, once more than a, th a th 1,024 people try and connect to us, start, oh. stop forwarding, like stop giving us those connections until we've handled existing connections. So the operating system will kind of hold it back, hold back the connections until there is room. So that's kind of our, our bottlenecks of where we're going to set the maximum for, for the server to handle. However, that's going to be a pretty big maximum most of the time because most connections are going to take less than like a one hundredth of a second. We're going to get the connection and we're going to immediately give a response and then that's it. And then we take another connection. So we're going to, we're basically never going to hit that limit ever. Then we are going to set, and this is probably the coolest part. We're going to set a static map. 
So, in the previous diagram... Uh-oh, hello. Windows got mad at me. In the previous diagram, we saw that our UWSGI server could not only connect to our HTTP, HTTP server, it would also connect to our static file system. Normally, you would have a web server like Flask, for example, and Flask would go and get the static files and return it itself. However, Flask is actually pretty slow at that. Getting large files, like a large CSS file or whatever, a JS file, an image, that can be uh, an intensive process, especially for Flask. So having your uh, having UWSGI get the file and not have to like let just totally we can let Flask totally ignore that responsibility. That is immensely helpful for us and will dramatically decrease it takes to uh, load images or even videos, for example. So we're going to set the static map to static. And just to prepare for that, let's create a static folder. And let's upload a file. So ooh, this one is good. We're going to set this logo. I think too bad. I think coding cactus just left, right? No. They're the they're the person that made this picture. If I recall. Too bad. No. I'm sure they would have been pretty happy. And we're going to put that logo in our static folder. No. Let's see. Did they miss any any comments? Yes. Oh yeah. Posting uh, posting links like that is a little risky. Is anyone else having the same errors installing UWSGI? No. Or is everyone able to install UWSGI? One person is. If that's it, we might continue. If this is like a fluke. But nope's is some yeah you're not. Not sure. That's pretty weird. I've seen that error before, but I forget exactly in what context. All right. So we have our static folder. And actually, if we... Let's just try running it right now. So if we stop it... Oh. It's taken a second. Oh, look at all this great debugging that it has, which we're actually going to uh, disable. Okay, it looks like Replit is uh, t taking a while to shut down the program. Um, and that's why you enable die on term. Because apparently die on term is false by default. That's the reason it's taking Replit so long to turn this program off. Because uh, it's resisting. And we don't really want that. Let's spam control C. Does that fix it? No. Okay, then PS dash A. Oh, PS, PSS, AL. Interesting. Well, let's kill the rebel and try this again. You could just clone mine. Yep, I can give you guys the, the link right now. I didn't even name it yet. So here you go. I'll put the link in the chat if you guys want to check it out. All right, now let's run it. It's going to install everything, as it should. Oh, and don't get, you might see in the bottom left, like the CPU is at 100. Don't be worried about that at all when it's installing packages. Installing packages requires a lot of, basically, your, your REPL, all it decided is, its purpose is to unpack the packages you want to install and put them in a folder and that takes a lot of CPU but only a short amount of time it's not a big deal at all all right great we've got this going let's take a look at what it's told us so we have our we have our uh, Linux machine this gives us some information about the machine detected a number of cores 16 it tells us where our working directory is and the binary path for the UWSGI file. Great, it's working out awesome. Gives us information about the memory page size. Let's see, our lock engine. 
Thunderlock. If you guys, oh boy, if you guys are really interested in this and want to learn even more about like the different intricacies and whatnot, look up Thunderlocks in WS UWSGI. There's a lot to talk about them. That's very complicated. Are the dev tools in the window a new feature? Yes, it is a new feature. I am glad you've noticed. Yes, this is a feature. It should be out for people who are hackers. Um, and yes, it is a, it's a new feature. Eventually, I think they're still working on it a little bit, but eventually it's going to be out for everyone. That'll be pretty cool. I really like that feature. I think that's really awesome. Let's see. It's 100% CPU for a minute when it's not installing stuff or running. Is that a Java REPL? If I had to guess, that's a Java REPL. If it's taking up 100% GPU randomly. <laughs> Let's see. Initializing Python interpreter. It's setting our server socket listen backlog is limited to 100. The graceful operations is 60 seconds. Single process, which we will change to multi-process soon. It says where our app is. It didn't mention our static folder. However, let's see if it, oh, I forgot to, I forgot to zoom in for this. Well, I gotta go full screen again. Let's see if our static folders work. So we're gonna go to slash static. Then we're gonna go to slash logo.png Boom, immediately got the response from the web server. And let's see, do we see that here? Did it log it? Oh, yes it did, via send a file. Very fast response. So, and that is why we have UWSGI do the returning files and whatnot, instead of, <laughs> instead of Flask, for example. And also, it did take like, for context, this is a this is a very big image file. Oh, it was Coder 100s. I thought it was. It might have been um, uh, coding cactuses. Let's see. You can see me. There he goes. Shane, there you are. A lot of lot of familiar faces here. All right. So, and of course, that's our web server. All right. So. We got the first part of the web server done. The next part that we're going to work on is messing with the logging. So all this information, kind of a waste. We don't need to know when people like got an image file, when they loaded the website. We don't really care about that information, or at very least, we don't care about all of this information. Oh, it actually says the response time. So. 267 milliseconds for sending the file. Not bad. All right, so disable logging. Logging equals true, but don't worry. We're not gonna disable all logging because we do wanna know whenever we error and also whenever our client errors. Because if our client errors, that could very well be actually our error. Like for example, if we if our, we gave them a website that is sending the server a bad request, no. then that means we gotta fix something. So we're going to do log dash 400 equals true and log 500 equals true. So that way, if we mess up for example, so let's see, we can actually, we're going to stop it. We're going to run it. We have this. Oh, no, we do not want to link a domain. Oh, interesting. It is still, it is still logging it. Hmm. Stable logging. No. Very odd. Okay. Well, let's see. If we go to, then we go to a path that doesn't exist. Can we see it? Yes. Error 404. 
It also locked to hundreds. Not sure exactly why, to be quite honest with you, it shouldn't have done that, but we'll get back to that later. Small issue. We still got to make it kind of, uh, make it actually be able to use multiple cores, for example. Yes, that is correct. You are getting that error, running it without its master process manager. And we will get to that error as well. No. So let's open up. Uh, we're going to set the next thing that we're going to do is Harakiri, which, and we're going to set that to 60, which basically just says forcefully kill workers after 60 seconds. The reason we do this is because we don't want, uh, we don't want our workers to turn into zombies. Basically, we don't want them just roaming around doing absolutely nothing, taking up resources that's why after a certain period of time, and for a computer, 60 seconds is a very long amount of time, we kill the workers. Then we need to set a max request, and we're going to set it to 1,000. So if a worker hits 1,000 requests, restart them. Max worker lifetime, and we're going to set that equal to 360. Let me just double check this. Uh... No. <laughs> what? How is this even? <laughs> okay, wait. Okay, I'll be honest, a little confused. <laughs> nope. Apparently our config wasn't even on, which actually does explain a lot more because I did have a lot of a lot of unexpected things were happening and I was just kind of pretended that they weren't happening. Turns out I forgot to put in the run command to use the config file. So now that we've done that, we can hopefully actually um, <laughs> actually start working on the server now and start actually working on the config. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, there we go. So let's take a new look to look at these changes. Now that the changes have actually applied. So... And it looks like it automatically used the the static was serving the static folder, which is pretty interesting. Um, that must be the default. So we have, let's see, can we see the max number? We saw the max number of connections was 100 before. Yes, now it's 1,024. That's great. And let's see, what other changes did we make? We also made changes to, um, we changed the mode to asynchronous. So that change has actually been made and we spawned a master process. See, and that was the error you were getting before because there was no kind of master process. Now there is. Okay. And hopefully now it's not loading. The, it's not logging the 200s anymore, but if we reload this, we get a 400, and it'll log the 400 error. So, boom. That's all great. We got there. My bad. <laughs> so, we've got these workers. Let's finish configuring them, because I got a little bit distracted. All right. So, then, next thing we got to do, we're going to do reload on RSS equals 2048. So once basically once they start, once the workers have um, allocated too much memory, we are going to kill them to get that memory back. And then reload or no worker 
worker reload mercy we're gonna set that to 60 and so then that's how long uh we wait before forcefully killing them okay so we've set a bunch of restrictions for the workers but we need something to also manage these workers and the algorithm we're going to use is based on busyness so we're going to do cheaper algo equals busyness then we're going to set the processes process is 128 and then we're going to set cheaper which is the process is, is the maximum amount of workers we allow cheaper is the minimum amount of workers we're going to allow we're going to set that to eight and then we're going to do cheaper dash initial we're going to set that to 16 oh 16 and then we're going to do cheaper dash overload and we're going to set that to one and then cheaper dash step we're going to set that to 16. so what does this do cheaper dash initial this is the amount of workers we create on startup then the overload is the length of a cycle in seconds and then 16 is how many workers to spawn at a time so let's say if we start getting a bunch of requests and we're being overwhelmed well we will increase the amount of workers by 16 every time but then we can get even more complicated than that and then when you guys start to actually like deploy your projects and use them in the wild you can um oops should have changed this you can decide how much um to adjust these numbers as, as much as you want so you may increase them you may decrease them depends on your needs all right we are going to do cheaper dash busyness and then dash multiplier and we're going to set that equal to 30 so this is how many cycles to wait before uh before killing workers and then cheaper busyness min equals 20. so and let's see so if and this is basically setting like how busy i guess workers have to be and if they're not that busy then kill them so all of these are basically setting kind of hard limits on workers but most of the time workers are going to be killed by the busyness algorithm we deploy uh oh cheaper not speaker cheaper i'll go that's a typo all right busyness min and then we need to set cheaper busyness dash max we're gonna set that to 70. so if we if they reach if the workers reach 70 percent of their max make new workers and then cheaper busyness and then we're gonna set backlog alert equals 16. so basically spawn emergency workers if yes. there are this many extra requests waiting in queue and then cheaper busyness backlog dash step equals two then this is how many emergency workers to create if there are too many requests in the queue so this is like continual the backlog alert is the immediately whenever there's too many extra requests it'll be 16 and then it will increase it by two as much as it can while there are still too many requests waiting in the queue and that's basically it so if we stop it and then we see sigint slash sig term received killing workers that's why we set die on term to true and vacuum to true and then we're going to run it And boom, we can see spawned, master process, spawned worker one, worker two, worker three, four, all the way to 16. Because we said initially respond 16 workers. And then our website is not receiving 
any requests at all. So what is it going to do? Let's wait a second. I don't know how long this is going to take. But, and let me move my... Oh, I'm not really in the way. I think you can just see. Good morning, Clon Twitch. We are developing, or we're, we're changing. We're taking our development servers and upgrading them to production servers. So yeah, we can see busyness. One second average busyness is at 0%. Cheap one of the 16 running workers. So it's going to kill one of the workers. PID 23. Four, seven. So we know it killed worker one. Oh, it also said worker one killed successfully. And then, boom, there are 15 running ones, but it's like we're still not getting any requests, so we're going to kill another worker. Yes, it might. Probably? Not quite sure. It might end up as a YouTube video. At very least, it might end up as a YouTube short, which would also go on our TikTok. At very least, Two days. Two days it's going to end up as a VOD available on our Twitch website. So we can see our website is not receiving any requests. So it is slowly decreasing the amount of workers we have. And that is great because look at our CPU. It's only using 1% of our CPU to just run this website. And then... If we were to receive a ton of requests, so let's do, I have a way of testing this. Let's see. I'm not going to act like I know, I knew what that meant, but it sounds interesting. Well, hopefully I can try and help you. So I'll, I'll give you the same explanation that I gave before. Welcome back. What's happening is when you create a web server, normally, especially on Replit, you got your client. You got your web server, and whenever your whenever the client wants to talk to your web server, so the web browser wants to talk to the web server, it'll just send a request, an HTTP request, boom, to the web server. And then the web server, boom, responds back with kind of like uh, with their answer to the to the request with the actual website. However, if you only have a single web server and there are a lot of different clients, the clients are going to overwhelm the web server and it's not going to be able to respond very quickly. So the solution is to use uh, or at least a solution. There are many solutions. A solution that works pretty well is to use WSGI. And specifically we're using the project UWSGI. So what happens is we have our master UWSGI process. We've got all these client connections. Every single client, boom, is connecting to our master UWSGI server. But our UWSGI server can handle it because it's not really dealing with the request. All it's doing is very simple. It's taking the HTTP request. It's turning it into a different protocol called WSGI and then sending it to one of the many processes of your web server that it created. So UWSGI will take, for example, this Flask app that we made. It's going to take this Flask app, and it just made, we can see here at the very beginning, it made 16 workers with the, using that Flask app. So there's 16 versions of our Flask app running. And every time we get a request, it's going to forward that request to one of those workers. That way, once our HTTP server responds, it can respond very quickly because it's using the WSGI format. And then our WSGI, former, our WSGI server will take the WSGI request and turn it into an HTTP response and send that back to the client. A lot of different acronyms in that explanation, but hopefully you have a little bit of a better idea. And we can see our web server is not receiving any requests right now. So right now it only has nine workers and that's going to keep decreasing until we hit, did we set a minimum amount of workers? I don't think so. So I think that's just going to keep going to one worker. Guess this would be a good REPL to boost if brought up for real. Yeah, absolutely. So, and this is going to be able to take full ex full advantage of a boosted REPL. So if you have this 
massive website serving a lot of people, this is the kind of technology you would use in addition to a boosted REPL. And then you'd be able to, I mean, you would have a very functional website. Let's see. So, but let's, I'll show you what happens when, um, when there are many requests. So in another window here, I'm going to go ahead and open a program. And it should be worth noting, I am specifically created this program to just test the capabilities of my own websites. Sending a bunch of requests to random websites just for the sake of sending them, not a cool thing to do. All right. So it's I'm doing this to my own website. And that's just because I simply want to test its capabilities and that is totally okay. But doing this to other people, not cool at all. Do not do that. So let's take this URL. I am going to put it into the program. And then we're just going to do, do this, comment that out comment this out and run it that is going to install the packages but in just a moment it's not i mean even like the program i'm making like it's it's not easy to like ddos a a, a website uh, or any well-built website it's not even like the program I made wouldn't even be capable of doing such a thing. It's just sending requests out from a REPL, but it's sending a lot. And that can be annoying sure. to people, especially if someone has like a development server and not a production ready server that cannot handle it. Not cool. Let's see. Is this, this is, well, it's taking a second to run. Oh, the REPL is not doing very well. Let's see here. I just want to, and it's actually other websites I could use to, uh, to test it. That are, if you look up like stress tester, there are, there are websites, for example, that, uh, exist. Of course you put in your own website. You don't put in someone else's website when you're doing that. Yes. Yeah, not this REPL. Not the REPL you can see. This REPL is doing fine. The uh, the REPL I was using is, is not doing as fine. No. Uh, no. Hmm. What is up with that? Come on. Okay. Hopefully we get this working. It's installing. It is, looks like it's working. Okay. And then we will probably see either in like the resources or in here. Oh, there we go. Oh, it killed a worker. Then immediately responded. Oh. I'm curious. So why do you guys think it's killing workers right now? Nope. It's getting, it's receiving a bunch of requests. Why is it receiving workers? Do any of you guys know? Nope. Glad to hear it. Does anyone here know why it's killing workers? So nope. it's receiving a bunch of requests right now. Obviously not that many to, to overwhelm it in any sense, but it's receiving a bunch of requests. Uh, yes. I have a theory. It has to do with our config. One of our config settings. Warm. Is it done? Oh. It did receive art. So it dealt with all the requests. 
it's know. doing that because of the also I should note the program we sent just sent 8,000 requests basically all at once like and they handled that like a champ so I mean granted granted once we have a more complex website than just simply returning the text hello world it will not it was going to take up more CPU than 1% Right now, probably the biggest thing restricting us was just bandwidth, just because, um, and max connections, because we're not really rendering anything. But when you do start to have a more complex website, it's going to be able to take more advantage of your CPU based on the amount of different cores it's going to be able to use. Let's see. I mean,. N not quite. I mean, if you did that in Node, it's not going to be able to uh, compete at all with uh, <laughs> with this by just setting it to production. Now, of course, you can do that. I mean, in Flask, for example, you can set the environment to production. That's what it, it was in. But this is specifically, it's a, this is more than just setting it to production. This is sort of like, and I mentioned it before, like a round robin. A round robin system is where just the server just distributes a bunch of requests equally to different workers. This is partially that, but it's also a lot more than that. It has the capability to scale down and scale up workers as needed. And it has the ability to kind of look at, um, uh, also serve static files, which is incredibly helpful. Let's actually do that right here. So in hello world, we're gonna do image um, source, and then we're going to do slash uh, static slash logo dot png, and then we're also going to set the height to 400. Let's see, we render that. It buried the workers. It uses some unique terminology, I will say. Boom, there we go. We got it. Oh, it actually did it above the text. Interesting. When the last time I did it, it was like below the text. But there we can see it rendered this massive image on the website. No problemo. Put that up there. Easy. Okay. Otherwise, I think it's the old version. Oh. Yeah, and we can see it, it barely even used any amount of, of the CPU. It's doing quite fine. Oh, also, I never answered the question. I asked why it was stopping. The reason is because of, or at least the reason I'm pretty sure, is because, let's see, where do we put it? Worker max requests, I believe. Let me check my... <laughs> my cheat sheet just to be doubly sure but basically we set uh, the amount of cycles that a worker does before it dies and it was reaching that amount of cycles before it died which is the reason that it kept killing workers while uh, it was receiving requests and there's a lot of reasons you might want to do this but actually for a lot of people, yes. there's a lot of reasons why you might not want to do this. And you might actually set a much higher bar for the amount of cycles that it'll receive before it resets. Yes. So that's why this configuration file exists. It exists for you to configure it. So once you move over your websites to UWSGI and you really start using it and taking advantage of it, take a look at all of these different numbers and mess around with them. Make sure, like, keep logs and then see yes. what works, what doesn't, and hopefully you'll have a professional website in no time. Does anyone have any questions? Because otherwise, I said this is going to be like an hour and 30 minutes. We're like a, like 20 minutes early. That's totally fine. I, I didn't expect this necessarily to take the entire amount of time, but I knew this would be pretty helpful. So if there's any questions I can answer, let me know. True, true. 
Zwack Sensei. <laughs> yes. Clip that. <laughs> Any questions at all? No. And also, feel free to try out other things. There's other uh, web servers, for example, like Gunicorn is another popular one wow. that you can wow. use. Sounds like time to be reading a bunch of cheaper so and the the one of the reasons i selected uwsgi is because they do have pretty good documentation it's also somewhat funny documentation it's not written always very um professionally it's uh maybe maybe the best way to put it is some of the documentation is written very casually and can be pretty amusing especially when you're talking about such a mundane topic <laughs> but UWSG has pretty good documentation. Gunicorn, though, another popular option. Waitress, another popular option. I really like UWSGI, and I think that it is uh, very, it's very popular, but especially with those who use Nginx, because it works well with that. However, you're not using Nginx, so that's not really a reason to use it. So feel free to try other options. Um, because because there are a lot and even like uwsgi has a lot of other ways to configure it too this is using like an ex like it's using workers it's asynchronous pretty standard um way to use it but you know there's there is a uh, room for uh improvement and or ways to change it like you could start using g event with it a very popular asynchronous library for python that takes a lot more configuration and messing around to get that working. No. Uh, but it is doable. Otherwise, I think that's going to be it. So, I hope you guys no. enjoyed the stream, learned something, and I better be seeing a lot more websites to start using production-ready servers, even if it's not in Python and any other language. Awesome. I'm glad to hear it. So, and this is, make you can fork this, um, use it in all of your other projects. I mean, it's a great template to use. I'm happy to be here. And if you enjoyed it, make sure you go on the Discord or you can follow our Twitch. But also, if you go on the Discord, all of the events are listed there. And you can uh, sign up to be notified for when they begin. Deploying what to production? Web servers. That's what we've been doing this entire time. And not even, like, web servers. I mean... Uh, WSGI works with sockets. You could host a game server, for example. No, it's okay. It's okay. We're going to be wrapping up soon, unfortunately. But if you just came in, we might end up having some uh, extra clips no. or tutorials on our YouTube about this. So make sure you are following our YouTube to be alerted when this happens. Or to be alerted when we put a, put a version of this on YouTube. Okay, well then, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you guys later. Adios.